Okay, welcome again, everyone. Um, we are continuing our review of the Epistles of Paul with 2 Corinthians 12 this time. By way of recap, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is covering a number of different things. The collection for the saints, he was encouraged by their response to his first letter and the changes that they made. Um, he is still needing to defend his ministry, if you will, his apostleship. And he does touch on that in chapter 10 and some of the sufferings that he went through in chapter 11. Um, he comes back to it here in a little bit different way in chapter 12. But he continues in this matter of what he calls boasting. Now, he's not really boasting, as we'll see as we go through this. He's actually using some sarcasm in here to make a point, um, and that can kind of get lost sometimes, especially in translation, literally. Um, so 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, he says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, um, meaning I don't know how much difference it'll make. And he'll explain as he goes through here. But he is doing this to, again, address these critics Verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or whether out of the body I don't know, but God knows. For such a one was caught up in the third heaven. So in verses 2, 3, and 4 here, and even 5, uh, he is using a common technique of the time in terms of public speaking, where he's talking about himself in the third person. So it doesn't seem as boastful. It doesn't seem like he's drawn attention to himself. Um, we even see this at times in our modern sense. Sometimes people will talk in the third person to a larger group and for the same reasons. So he says this happened 14 years ago. So based on the probable date of when Paul wrote this second letter to the congregation at Corinth, the 14 years ago would have been roughly around 43 AD, um, and it would have been around the same time that he was in Jerusalem. In Acts 22, he makes more of that account through Luke, um, but this is when this took place. He's either having a vision or being inspired, and he's not sure, you know, in this way, what which God is doing, but he says, uh, like verse three, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God does. Verse four, how he was caught up into paradise, heaven. Now we know he didn't actually go to heaven. We have the account, the statement in Acts that no one has ascended to heaven except the son, the one who came from heaven. So we know this is at least a vision. Um, he said he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to order. The word lawful there is very interesting. It's not wrongly translated into English, but it's not clear here because lawful to us has a different connotation. But what the word in the Greek is talking about is that it would not be proper to speak of this thing. Um, now, we can say, well, why wouldn't it be profitable or why wouldn't it be proper? And probably because it's not important. It's, it's uh, maybe drawing, again, too much attention to Paul. Maybe it doesn't really address the things uh, that he's trying to address here. Uh, whatever the case may be, he says in verse 5, on behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my weakness. So he's saying, I'm, I'm boasting, but I'm not boasting. And the reason why I would boast would be for my weakness. This is a similar statement he made in the last chapter that we looked at. And the reason he says this is that he knows, as he makes the statement, that when he's weak in the flesh, he is strong in the spirit. He knows what God is using these things for. So the boasting that he is doing is not because he was the one involved, but because of what God did through him. This is what he's focusing on as we see as we go through this here. So in verse 6, he says, for if I would desire to boast, I would not be foolish, for I speak the truth. It's, it's no, There's no brag, it's just fact. There's the old Western back in the early 70s that fellow used that statement I've always liked. You know, it's not boasting to the same degree if it's involving truth. And this is, again, the point he's trying to make here, and he's made previously, as in the, this letter, previous chapters in this letter. He says, but I refrain, that is, I refrain from boasting, 
so that no man may think more of me than that which he sees in me or from me. So typically when someone boasts, right, they're trying to draw attention to themselves. Look at what I am. Look at who I am. Look at what I've done, you know, and make this the pinnacle of whatever point they're trying to make. He says, I don't want that. If I'm desiring to boast, it's foolishness, right? We're, we're making ourselves important. And in this case, especially, he's saying, I, that's not what I'm trying to do. But if I am boasting, it's because it involves the truth. And the truth is the gospel message. The truth is what he is desiring to teach them and lead them into, right? He's the vessel. He even uses that analogy a little later. Um, that he's being poured out. So he's he's just the receptacle by which God can, in which God can place his spirit and use him. So what he's essentially saying is here, forget what you hear of me. Watch what I'm saying and doing. Listen, excuse me, listen to what I'm saying. Watch what I do. That, that tells us the character of somebody. We can talk as long as the day is, but at the end of the day, even humanly, we pay attention to what, what someone says and what they do, what, what they say and follow through on doing. And this is the point that Paul is making here. And, and again, in verses five and six, he's using a common Greek, what's called a rhetorical device, public speaking, where he's basically saying, I can say this, but I'm not going to say this. But yet he really says it, doesn't he? So it's this roundabout way, again, of trying not to appear too braggadocio, but yet nonetheless having to address the point at hand so verse seven by reason of the exceeding greatness of the revelations because god has used me in dramatic ways we even read in chapter um chapter 11 some of the things that he had gone through and that might be sort of seen as a resume list if you will but he says you know god has done great things to me you know even to this point he's already written uh, five or so letters that have been preserved for us. There are a number of others that are alluded to, you know, the going through acts, the opportunities, if you will, that he had to go before rulers and kings and public audiences. You know, sometimes the press, our own press can lead us down a wrong path. And we start thinking this is because of me. Look what I've done. So he says, because God has used me in these very dramatic ways, notable ways, he says that I should not be exalted excessively. So that I wasn't exalted excessively is what he's saying. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me that I should not be exalted excessively. So he recognizes here that whatever physical limitation he had, we'll, we'll come back to that point here in a little bit. Whatever this was that was irritating, bothersome, limiting, whatever what happened to manifest itself, he recognized that God sort of put this governor on him so that he would not become vain and not become arrogant in what God was doing through him. So the comment there that I've underlined, a messenger of Satan to torment me, there's a great deal of speculation if you go through the various commentaries and such, not that I'm recommending necessarily you do, but they wonder, what is this messenger of Satan? And I, I believe what he's doing here is using this as a metaphor, much like the affliction that Satan brought on Job. It wasn't specifically that Satan did something, but Satan orchestrated, or sa Satan has uh, gone to God and said, you know, he, he'll only do this because you bless him, whatever the sort of things like we read in Job. Um, so it doesn't have to be direct, but nonetheless, um, that it was something that God allowed. And so, again, he's making this point. I recognize this. Now, this may have been some of the criticism. This may have been individuals saying, well, we'll look at Paul. Because even within the Jewish world, the thought at the time was, as even we read in the Gospels, if you had a major physical affliction, notable ones were either demonic possession that Christ would remove the demons or the man, the most, probably the most famous ones, the man that was blind from birth. 
And even the disciples asked what sin he had committed or what sin his parents had committed. And Christ answered, none. That, you know, this was allowed so that I could do this. Um, so maybe the criticism was that because Paul had whatever this limitation was, what he calls a thorn in the flesh, that they looked at him as less than. He wasn't as spiritual. He wasn't as righteous. He wasn't as whatever. So he's he's just hitting it straight on here. So verse 8, then he says, concerning this thing, this thorn in the flesh, whatever this affliction was, he says, I begged the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So he pleaded with God. He went to God repeatedly. Now, if you go to Galatians 6.11, as he finishes that letter to the congregation at Galatia, he says there, he says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And so some have said, well, maybe from Acts 9, and when he was struck down blind, God had allowed this thorn in the flesh to be something associated with his eyes. You know, we might think cataracts, or we might think whatever, double vision, or whatever it happened to be, but that he had written in larger than normal handwriting from Galatians 6.11 we read, now, some will also go back and say, well, the messenger of Satan could have been a person, this thorn in the flesh. Well, that doesn't reconcile with Galatians 6, or sorry, 4, verse 13, because he says there, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preach the gospel to you at the first, physical infirmity. It seems that whatever it was, was something physical, whether it was his eyes, whether it was something else. Could have, could have been, you know, a chronic um, something that he might have been dealing with. Whatever the case was, he says, I begged God three times. Now, the first two times, he obviously got a no. And so the third time, then he answers what he got back or right, relays what answer he got back. So in verse nine, he says, he has said to me, right? He's begging God. So God has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This goes counter to ev almost every culture. If you're seen as weak, you are less than. And this is where Christianity stands out. Weakness is not of itself notable, but if weakness is connected to God's power, then that's all the difference in the world because God can work with that. God will work with that. So my grace, my favor, my um, blessings, my reconciliation will work through this, 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 whatever the, this is, you know, it can be bad eyesight. It can be hearing loss. It can be a genetic weakness as we age, whether we, you know, get uh, problems with our bones or our back or, you know, it can be, Lack of strength, it can be diseases that afflict us. It doesn't matter. That part doesn't matter because this life is not the life God desires for us. This life is the life for training, right? John 10.10, 10, God desires the, the, the life that is going to be eternal for us. But if we have weakness in this life, that may be exactly what we need in order to see God and allow God to work through us. Because then we're not focused on ourselves. If things are going really, really well, if we never had a trial, never had a sickness, never had a problem in our life, we would be probably very spoiled, petulant children, right? We would start demanding things from God. But when we're reminded of these weaknesses, then we realize our physical limitations. This is part of the value of fasting, right? That we recognize... <laughs> We don't have something to drink. We don't have something to eat. We're not going to last long physically. We'll die. You know, if we don't have breath of life, we're dead. And to recognize and remember where that comes from. And this is what Paul is saying. Look, you may see these things as problems, but what if that is what God is using to perfect you? My power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul acknowledges this and says, most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in weakness in my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest on me. He said, if I had to make a choice between having no sickness, whatever this thorn in the side was, no problem, or being weak with these things, that I'll take the latter so that Christ can work with me. 
So there are a number of verses in this regard. In Romans 5 there, um, we can read, he says, uh, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of glory. That is, that we recognize that God can work with us no matter where we are. Um, similar thoughts are made in 1 Peter 4 and 2 Corinthians 7, as we read earlier in this um, review of this letter. <clears throat> so again, the Jews and the Greeks, but especially the Jews, saw spiritual problems in physical weakness, whatever that was. Blindness, demon possession, uh, the woman that had the issues of, of blood for you know most of her life, you know, all of these different things, they saw those individuals as less than because being ceremonially unclean, they couldn't go to the temple, not recognizing what else God would do or could do. And so then he says in verse 10, therefore, because of all these things, then he says, I take pleasure. Now, pleasure is not sadomasochism. Uh, you know, he, he's not He's not pleased in the pain. The pleasure there is something to choose. I would rather than choose weakness and injuries, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake, right? This is not because we get some sort of wrong thrill out of these things. Um, he says, if those things are there, I will, I will choose that so that Christ can do what he needs to do. He says, for when I am weak, when I appear weak physically, when I'm dealing with these trials and tribulations, these physical problems, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And as I write there, this is a spiritually mature perspective because our focus is not on ourself. This is kind of a theme, if you will, of what Paul is discussing here in 2 Corinthians 12. The folk, if the focus is on us, and so many of the critics, that's what they were doing. They were trying to minimize Paul so they could exalt themselves, whether it was spiritually, whether it was physically, or whatever other way. But Paul is saying, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strongest. Because when I when I get myself out of the way, and if it takes a physical limitation, if it takes a trial, if it takes a tribulation or some persecution to, to help me stop and remember I can't fix any of this. That's where all of us had to come to when we were baptized, wasn't it? I can't make myself have eternal life. I can't pay for my sins by myself without paying with it with my own life. I can't change my carnal mind to be spiritually minded. I can't do those things. And we can, unfortunately, all of us over time, even after baptism, drift away from remembering that. And so Paul says, if I have to choose, I will choose these things so I can stay strong in Christ. So verse 11, he says, I have become foolish in boasting. All of this, he says, I shouldn't have to do any of this. But he says, you compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I inferior to the very best apostles, though I am nothing. So he's kind of taking them to task here. And he's reminding them of all that he's gone through here. He says, none of that was necessary. Because even going back up to what he said earlier, he said that, you you know me. You should see what I'm doing, right? This, this is what we, we read earlier um, in verse 6, especially. You know, watch what I do, listen to what I'm saying, and make sure they reconcile and point to what, what those things are. So he's saying the same thing down here. You compelled me to go through those things because you should have been defending me. You've seen me in action. You've heard my words back up with action. You've seen, as he'll get to here, you've seen Titus. You've seen the other brother. You've seen what we've done. I shouldn't have to be going through this and defending this. So he says, for in nothing was I inferior to the very best apostles, though I am nothing. Now, I take this verse a couple of different ways when he's talking about the very best apostles, because previously he had to denounce those who claimed to be apostles, and they weren't. And so if you read the commentaries here, they think that he's comparing himself to the 12, 
Now, he may be. Maybe that was part of the criticism that was directed his way. Well, you're 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 the add-on. You're the 13th. You're not of the 12. You're not of the ones that you know lived and walked with Christ. Uh, that could have been it. So he may be saying, look, compared to those other apostles, he says, I was not inferior to them because Christ taught him, didn't he, as well? For three years in the wilderness, he got one-on-one -on -one training. But even if he's not talking about the 12, those who claim to be apostles, he said, even the very best of them, he says, I'm not inferior to them. Look at what God has given me. Look at what God has done through me. Look at what you have because of what God has done through me. So in either case, he's saying, I'm I'm not the stand in here. I'm, I'm not the plan B. I shouldn't have to boast on these things, but because you press the point, I'm just making sure you understand. I'm not inferior to any of these guys. Now, this is not conceited bragging. This is, again, as he said up before, it, I, I'm simply going to speak the truth in verse 6. You know, I'm just stating, and that's not wrong, because, he, again, he knows the thorn in the flesh is keeping him in check. But that doesn't mean he shouldn't speak out for the truth. And in that, he says, I am in fear to no one when it comes to the truth which is a very powerful thing to consider. Now, God will give different ones different authority, different blessings, talents, whatever, in terms of preaching, teaching those things. But when it comes to the truth, you either have it or you don't. This is salvation, right? You either have it or you don't. And in that respect, there is no grades of it. So he says, I'm not inferior. Your calling is not inferior to my calling. Someone in a different congregation, even a different time in God's church. It's not inferior because the calling God has given us is the calling that everyone gets. And so this is a very interesting verse to kind of ponder. He sounds like he's coming off pretty hard, and it's really just being direct. He, he Because they're, they've been very, some of them have been very caustic, if that's the right word. They've been very hard on him. And he's having to go through this so that everyone sees what the standard should be and that those that are criticizing him really have no leg to stand on. So verse 12, truly, the signs of an apostle were worked among you in all perseverance. This goes again back up to verse 6 where he says, what am I doing? You know, a part of the criticism was that he was making merchandise, if you will, of God's people. That he was simply there for the money. And sometimes that's true, but Paul says, look at me. Have I taken any money from you? He didn't even take their tithes so that they couldn't complain that he was getting rich off of them. He, he didn't do it. And when Timothy, or sorry, when Titus came and the other brothers mentioned, they didn't do that as well. They, they wanted to be completely above board. Okay, this is a sore point with you. You think we're here just to do this? Then we won't do it at all. And they weren't doing it to sort of, brag like he's saying here we did it for your sake okay if this if this is the stumbling block you know like he said earlier um in, in the first book about the meats if, if the meat is going to be stumbling if i if i go to a, a pagan temple and their market and buy a piece of meat he said if that's going to make you stumble then i won't do it so he says, I've worked, I've done all these things. God has done many, many things through me to serve you, to serve all of his people as he's called them. He says, I've done signs and wonders and mighty works. And we probably don't have all of those, probably not even close to all of those recorded. But I think about when he was traveling to Rome and they were shipwrecked and Paul helps everybody get to shore which was a pretty amazing thing because not many people, not even many sailors of the time knew how to swim. So everybody gets to the island. They're safe. All the Roman soldiers are there. They're, they're worried because, you know, if you lose a, a prisoner, it costs them their life. And so everybody's there. Everybody's safe, right? They make a fire to kind of dry out, warm up, and a snake bites Paul. And what did they think? What we talked about earlier. Well, he must have been a pretty big sinner to have that kind of death. They just figured he was a dead man walking. And then he doesn't die. Yeah, that's a pretty amazing thing. Then he's able, God allowed that so that Paul could have the attention, if you will, but also uh, the deference 
that would come from listening because if he survived something like that, then there must be something else going on. And that that's just one example. So these signs, these wonders, these mighty works, verse 13 then, he says, for what is there in which you were made inferior? What was it that made you inferior to the rest of the churches? So he's putting this back onto them. Okay, if you think I'm inferior, and by extension that makes you inferior, because I'm not the best, right? I'm not the right guy. I'm not the one that should be here. I'm not the one that has the true title. If that's inferior, then what was it that made you inferior to the rest of the churches because of it? And it's a great question, because then they have to answer, right? They have to take accountability. What was it we did? What was it that we prevented? What was it that maybe played into this that we're a part of? And in that regard, then they they have to look inwardly instead of just focusing. It's easy to make somebody else our problem, right? Little kids, or why why did you hit her? Why did you hit your sister? Well, she made me so angry. No, she didn't make you anything. You chose to be angry. She might have done something wrong as well, but you chose and we do that all the time. We want to blame other people. We want to blame the politicians. We want to blame businessmen. We want to blame, blame somebody else. But where's the accountability in what we've done? And this is what he's saying here. He says, so, unless the burden is that I myself was not a burden. <laughs> this, is, this is some of the sarcasm that Paul has gotten to in this letter that he's writing here he says okay so you say you're inferior was it because i didn't burden yourself burden you with myself you know i didn't i didn't take your ties i didn't come in and make you do this or that for me you know no no one's been my slave my chauffeur you know i, I haven't compelled you to do anything in this regard to take care of me so he says if i've done that forgive me I, i'm i'm sorry i was a burden to you now you have <laughs> You have to be very careful how you use sarcasm because it doesn't always translate well using the word, you know, meaning not everybody picks up on it, even if you're speaking the same language. But he's making this point here about inferiority. If, if it was that I, I didn't make myself a burden, would you have respected me more if I had done those things? And I would suspect I maybe the obvious answer would be yes. Because it seems like whatever he did to serve them they didn't appreciate um and so then moving down to verse 14 he says behold this is the third time i'm ready to come to you and i will not be a burden to you for i do not seek your possessions but you meaning what god is doing through you i i want you right other writers talk about being jealous with a godly jealousy paul talks that way in the first letter as well that his he saw part of his responsibility as being jealous of them for God's sake. His desire was for them to have eternal life, not their possessions. He, he didn't care about that. He says, for the children ought to not save up for the parents, excuse me, but the parents for the children. Paul says, you know, I'm like a spiritual father here, right? God used me to call you to eternal life, to hear the gospel message, to become a, a son or a daughter of God in, in this life so you could live in that for eternity. In that sense, he says, I fathered you. And as a father, I am trying my best to provide everything you need to succeed beyond me. That should be the desire of every parent. Instead of the parent saying, okay, well, all right, you're old enough to work. Go out now. I don't have to cover all this stuff. You, you can pay the electric bill. You can buy some of the food. You can at least pay rent, whatever. That's not the way it should be done. So he, he says, I have this love. Paul gets this bad rap of being such a hard, onerous, misogynistic person. He was not. He cared deeply for God's people. And you read sections like this that should come out. He says, I'm not desiring your possessions. He's, you know, essentially saying, if I wanted that, I could have had that. I could have taken all that. But he says, verse 15, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more abundantly, am I loved less? He says, I'm not holding anything back here. But it seems the more I love you, the less I'm loved. 
which is a really sad thing to contemplate that he, he didn't feel respected. He didn't feel honored. He didn't feel even the deference that should have come his way. And we have to be careful with that, right? Because the human agents are not God, right? I don't stand before or in between anyone in their relationship with God. I can't, I'm not responsible for that. And if I take that on, I'm doing them and myself a disservice. But he says, there should be this reciprocity, right? I've sacrificed myself for you, for your spiritual edification, but yet it seems the more I do that, the less you care about me. So in Philippians 2 and verse 17, he writes this to that congregation. He says, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. Now, I was having a conversation the other day with another pastor and he was thanking me for some of the things I do outside of the congregations I serve. And I said, well, I thank you. I said, you're traveling internationally. He serves as a senior pastor in one of the international areas. I said, you know, the things that I do were within a couple of hours of my home. I said, you know, I, I, I don't like the long flights. I did that last year at the feast to serve. But, you know, to take a flight to some of these areas and you're, you're between the the flying and waiting in the airports and the security checks and getting your bags and all those things. I mean, some of these guys, you know, it's 20, 26, 30 some hours to get to where they need to be to serve God's people. I mean, you have to do that because you love God's people because you won't do that if you're not getting paid what you think you should be paid because it's just draining he says, I've, I've done this. I, I, I've poured out myself for you. He didn't hold anything back. And so he says, verse 16, but be it so, I didn't burden myself to you. He, even if you're not going to love me back the way I love you, okay, I'm not going to be a burden to you. But being crafty, I caught you with deception. And the, and the commentaries don't know what to do with this. Some get close to understanding what he's talking about here is because he didn't rule them, because he didn't demand of them, because he didn't come in with this authoritarian, autocratic viewpoint, it's my way or the highway, he says, I was crafty in that I continue to serve you and I caught you with deception. So he says, I, I must have done it without you knowing it. If I was that sneaky, I must have burdened you i must have done these things without you even understanding how i did it and he'll talk about titus and this brother here in a moment how you know they they served the same way that he did and yet they didn't take care of, or take advantage of them either so how how am i doing it paul's saying so he said i must have caught you with deception verse 17 did i take advantage of you by any one of them who i sent you not just titus but any anyone else so this is the other thing that many forget. They think that Paul was kind of this lone man out there just, you know, bouncing around these different areas, setting up all these things, taking care of everything himself, that nobody else could be involved, nobody else could serve. And that's the exact opposite of what he did. I mean, we have the letters to Timothy and Titus, and we call those the pastoral letters because he was giving them instruction and advice of, of how to pastor what we would call pastoring a congregation. And so he would leave these individuals. He sent Titus at different times. He talked about that earlier, recovered. He sent him ahead. He sent others to take care of the offering that Corinth was putting together to send to Jerusalem. Paul was more like a project manager, an overseer, this senior, what we call senior pastor, you know, someone that had the recognized authority to sort of direct others to help take care of these things. So he says, did anyone I send do these things? The answer is no, they didn't. So then verse 18, I exhorted Titus and I sent the brother with him. We talked about the brother last couple of times. It, it's obviously they're unnamed, whoever they are. A lot of the commentaries speculate that the brother was some member of Corinth of note that Paul was using. And rather than sort of over-exalt him, you know, and sort of put a target, if you will. Well, he's just doing whatever Paul wants him to do. You know, it was recognized this person served. 
So this is kind of another way of mentioning it without mentioning it sort of thing. So he said, I sent Titus, I sent the brother. Did, did they take advantage of you? He said, didn't we walk in the same spirit? Don't we walk in the same steps? Didn't we teach the same thing? Didn't we instruct you the same way? Didn't we serve you the same way? Didn't we teach you and point you to Christ and teach the gospel message? Didn't we do all those things the same way? So if I'm sending Titus, I'm sending this brother, if I'm sending others and they're doing all of these things you don't have a problem with, why do you have a problem if I'm doing it? None of us took advantage of you. So he says, verse 19, again, do you think that we are excusing ourselves to you? We're trying to justify ourselves or we're trying to explain these things away. He says, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. God is my witness, but all things, beloved, are for your edifying. So they're not taking the tithe with so that they could be edified. That friction over whether they should pay that or not. Just Paul just took it off the table. Okay, that's fine. You should be, but I won't take it. It'll be used for other things. You know, I'm going to come serve you, even if I'm not loved, even if I'm not recognized. I'm going to come serve you because I want you to be edified in your calling. I want you to grow in your calling. Nothing that I would say or do to stand between you and them, and you and the Father and the Son. He says, I'm not going to do those things. I'm going to Everything I'm doing is for that purpose. And the word edifying there is very interesting because it speaks to building a dwelling, building a place to live. It's, it's an architectural term. It's, it's a combination of two Greek words. But it's not just edifying in the sense of teaching. It's it's foundational. You're right. And in terms of a dwelling, this is where we live. This is our home. This is our safe place. This is where we put the things we prize. This is where we have family. But he says, in all things, I'm doing this so you are built up to be able to dwell with Christ. He says, for I'm afraid that by any means, when I come, I might find you not the way I want to. He wants to find them thoroughly excited about God's way of life and doing everything they can with Christ living in them to exemplify him. He says, that's what I want to find. But he says, I'm, I'm afraid that that might not be the case. And he says, and that I might be found by you as you don't desire. So going back to the first letter there in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, essentially, look, do you want me to come and be a taskmaster? Do you want me to come like I had whips or rods and I'm just beating you to do what I want you to do? He says, that's not how I'm going to come. But he says, I may have to come and be hard. That by any means there would be strife. He says, this is what I'm concerned about. That you may not be the way I want you to be. That I know you should be. And it, that it may be found that you don't like how I'm coming because of these things. Right? So he mentions strife and jealousy and outbursts and anger and factions and slander, whisperings, proud thoughts and riots. I mean, these are some pretty pointed words in terms of behavior and character. Um, because again, they, they should be about the business of spiritual change and growth. So what's interesting to these to me with these words here is that they are not the same list, if you will, that we find in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Galatians 5, the works of the flesh that are there. But they produce the same thing, don't they? So if we were to break down each of those words, and these words are very close. I mean, they're good. There's nothing here that I would challenge in a negative way. But the limitations of any time translating from one language to the other is you lose some nuances. And so if we go through this, you know, strife is quarrels or debates or wrangling. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where they're wrangling over some minutia of what they think should be done spiritually? They may be right, but usually, in my experience, they're wrong. But the strife that that creates, this, this wrangling over things, and it, it begins to create division, doesn't it? Or at least stress. Jealousy there in the Greek has a meaning of envy. That you're that 
yes, you are jealous, but not just jealous. You want it. So whatever it is, but you haven't done the work for it or it wasn't given to you. But that jealous then changes the relationship, doesn't it? I don't like you because you have what I want. It's not that I want it. And I'm, and I'm, come, I'm going to come to you and say, what do I need to do so I can have that? I'm jealous because I don't want you to have it. I should have it. So this priority that I'm better and I should have it. You're not as good. This is part of what Paul touched on earlier. Outbursts of anger is wrath. And we don't use the word wrath much in English. It doesn't have a depth of understanding. But in the Greek, it, it has a meaning of this, um, not just hard breathing, but have you ever heard like a horse or a cow, when there's something they don't like, they'll make this kind of thrusted exhale. And, and if you know animals, there's something going on. They don't like something. You're creating a concern. They're worried. They don't like what's going on. And so this is outbursts of anger. It's this forced exhale that you're not happy. And it's not just that you're not happy, this anger that's associated with it. You've become short-tempered. You've become impatient. You've become judgmental. And, and it, it presents itself as this anger, but it's this <clears throat> kind of anger. I'm I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to whatever. So then the next here is factions. Um, and in this, the Greek has the meaning of intrigue or contention. Contention in the sense of, uh, of, of gaining something, of self-seeking. So this faction is that we're divided because of what I want. And it connects to these other things, though, doesn't it? All of these connect to each other because it's wrong thinking, wrong attitudes. So then we have slander. Slander we're more familiar with, right? We're saying something untrue about someone in the hopes or the desire that we have other people see them in this negative light as well, right? We, we can't argue the facts, so we're going to malign their character. Slander is just awful this is in the greek also has the meaning of backbiting of defamation which we understand there but you're going behind people which is also with whisperings whisperings is slander as well but it has to do with um this gossiping right we're not going to the individuals we're told in matthew 18 we're not going and saying look there, there's we've got some stuff between us we need to talk about we need to figure this out so that we can walk together instead of being at odds here, right? That is such an important thing in God's view because of the attitudes that it creates negatively that he even said through Christ, right? If this is, if this is something that you recognize, you remember as you bring an offering that you have this division, leave the offering, go take care of the relationship, fix what needs to be fixed so that everybody is the family again properly, then come back and do your offering because he says that's more important. If, if you don't have those relationships, the offering's meaningless. You're just, you're just going through the motions. So the whisperings are dangerous, right? Because we create these, we even say this, these whisper campaigns, right? We're not addressing it head on. We're not being honest in our conversations. We're, we're kind of, well, did you hear the latest? Can you believe this sort of thing? And again, it's dangerous because it, it goes down a path of maligning someone, and, and sometimes they don't even know what's going on. And then proud thoughts. Proud thoughts have to do with this matter of haughtiness, and we have a number of scriptures that speak to this. Jude really gets into this in his letter, in his short one-chapter letter, as he wrote. This was, he, he called this the, uh, the ungodly men. You know, but um, Jude 1, verse 16, just to read one to you, says these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. These are, as as Jude labels them, they're, they're apostates, right? They may have the appearance 
but but they don't have the substance. They're just pretending. And so these proud thoughts, again, well, I should have that. This was Cain. This was Korah. We have other examples, right? Well, I should be the one at the front. I should be the one with the title. I should, whatever. A sense of entitlement to me is one of those things I just, I, I, I can't tolerate. We, God doesn't owe us anything because he's already given us everything. So proud thoughts, this is another thing that, that Paul was addressing. And lastly there, then he has riots. In this matter of riots, we think of, you know, huge crowds destroying property, you know, marching with all these whatever slogans they're throwing out there, and you, you better not cross them. That certainly is the case, but at its core, what it's talking about is instability or disorder. And all of these things create division, don't they? And God hates division. He says that very directly. I hate division. Because division is of Satan. Satan wants to tear down. Division tears down. God is about love, which expressed in a godly way, builds up. Everybody gains in an environment of love. And so this is what Paul is saying. These are things that are still there that he even knows of from a distance. Because he says, I'm coming. I'm going to come to you. But these are still things that I have a concern about. Now, they did respond positively from the first letter. They had tolerated sin. They were getting drunk at the Passover. They were doing these things, taking each other to court. And they did respond, which is good. But they had more work to do. And if we read a, a chapter such as this, or a, a whole book, a letter such as this, we can be reminded of their example. But we should not say, well, how in the world could they have not seen what they needed to do? Because this is preserved for us as well. Have we ever been part of strife or jealousy or outbursts of anger or any of these other things? If we're honest with ourselves, we're probably going to say yes. And it's a reminder, this is not of God. This is not what is helpful when God for God to build his family. So then to finish out the chapter, he says here, he says, by any means that I would find these things, he says, verse 21, that again, when I come, my God would humble me before you. And I would mourn for many of those who have sinned before now and not repented of the uncleanness and sexual immorality and lustfulness which they committed. Now, again, you'll find a great deal of discussion in the commentaries about what Paul is talking about here in terms of that God would humble me. And what I like in, in reading even the Greek and the ones that seem to put that together more honestly, honestly mean faithfully, that essentially he says that I would not come, as I said earlier in verse 20, he doesn't want to be found in a way they don't desire he wants to come humbly before them. And in that respect, going back earlier in the letter, he said that he want, he came to them with tears and weeping. And again, we don't think of, most people don't think of Paul in that regard. But in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 4, he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, Paul didn't delight in any of the correction he had to get. Any pastor that is a true servant of God, will not delight in any correction they need to do. It's painful. Nobody wants to do it, really, if you have the mind of God, because that's not the relationship we want. So Paul says here, I came with a much affliction and anguish of heart. I wrote to you with many tears that you should be made sorrow. He recognized it sometimes. And this, again, is Matthew 18. You have to have the hard conversations at times. Because if you don't, they just continue to fester. And then you get people assuming things, or you, then you get a, an overly wrong reaction. Even if it's the right thing, it's gone on so long, you have to be even harsher. You have to be even more strict. But he says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 4, to finish that verse, he says, I did this, that you may know that I love you so abundantly. And this is what he's saying here. 
I want to be, I want to remember that I, I, I came to you. I want to come to you with tears and weeping. I want to be humbled before you. And I'm going to mourn those who have not repented. Because evidently, even from verse 20 here, realizing there, there was other issues. Now, remember, Corinth was sort of at a crossroads, much like a New York City or a Chicago or L.A. You know, there's there's a lot of travel and it was a very hedonistic town. Corinth had the reputation within the Roman world that there was nothing that was off limits that they would do. And we're seeing vestiges of that even in this nation. The immorality is just astounding at times and how brazen people are about it um, and, and how condemning they are of those that don't accept it. And, and this was Corinth. And so, Paul, there's a challenge in working with people that are in those environments. But with God's Holy Spirit, there really should be no difference than anyone else dealing with whatever issues anywhere else. And to, be, to, to mourn for them. Why would he mourn for those that have not repented? Because left unrepented, they won't be in God's family. We, we mourn death because it's a loss. Paul sees the potential. God sees the potential in us. He created us with this potential to be in his family. And so I, I read a chapter like chapter 12 as Paul being very sad. That they're just... They're getting it, but they're not getting it. They're still stuck on things they shouldn't be stuck on, whether it's him or whether it's these past things that they're, they're still not addressing to the level that they should. And they're listening to people that, that they really shouldn't be listening to. And they're still dealing with some carnal spirit, carnal nature. So chapter 13 ends up being some of these final cautions and then his greetings, if you will reminders of how to love one another and those that love them so it, it'll be sort of a short chapter and we'll cover that next time but what i want to do next time then as well is kind of just walk through the whole book up to the end to remind us of the, the various themes if you will of the chapters and how paul was addressing these things and kind of have an overview of the book as we end as we had an overview of the book as we began so we'll pick up with chapter 13 next time.